Good morning everyone, I have a question for you. Do you know the second amendment by heart? Do you like to blow shit up? And finally have you have used your powers as a highly appointed government official to decree that your neighbor's house is in reality your house? If you answered yes to any of those questions I have good news for you. In the latest patch CA overhauled the entire empire faction and they added in several new units including a massive land going boat which is good news for all my seasick pirates out there. It took a long time boys but we got there in the end. <laughs> That's so stupid. They did also add a brand new legendary lord that we won't be playing because I only have eyes for one man and he is the emperor himself and his name is Karl Franz. Much like the Holy Roman Empire upon which it is based we use a combination of swords, muskets, black holes and techno sorcery to force our will upon an unfriendly world. We do this not because we want to, we do this because we have to. And also because we really, really want to. Our fractured state is surrounded by the undead, orcs, ogres, beastmen, sentient trees, hippies, dwarves, the French, the Russians, and probably a bunch of other things that I have completely forgotten that I exterminated in a prolonged artillery barrage. So if the empire is going to continue to exist in this cold harsh world, it is going to need a firm hand to point the way. We do this by showing the local rebels that while their input in questions of state is appreciated, it is not needed and definitely not wanted. Rebellion is a disease and high explosive ordnance is the cure. So with our lands back in line again we cast our eyes further northwest to the city of Marienburg. Our first move of the war was taking the mountain fortress of Berg Bress. We did this in the hopes of luring out the Marienburg army to face us in the field. When they refused to play ball because they're a bunch of goddamn cowards, we fell back again to entice them to come out and retake their fort. This also did not work and instead we get declared war upon by Hot Topic Gandalf. So with that in mind and since there was no way to crack Marienburg while her army was still cowering behind its thick ass walls, I head north to liberate the city of Kerberg from the orcs. Which means that we are now at war on three fronts with only one army at our disposal. But hey, what's the worst that can happen? It's not like the undead can break through the fortress of solitude, that's basically impossible possible and surely the Marienburg army won't take this opportunity to sally out and destroy all of my well laid out plans. Oh wait that is exactly what they did. My strategic genius truly knows no bounds. Thankfully Carl was in a position to immediately counterattack, giving the rest of the world the illusion that I had been in control the entire time and that I hadn't just dropped the ball big time. The Marienburg forces set up on the top of this hill daring me to come and get them. So I bombarded them with our superior artillery and forced them to come to me instead. I am 99% sure that I was forced to advance on our enemies like once in this entire campaign. Having superior long range artillery in this game is like having a Uno reverse card and I am going to miss it when it's gone. Since we couldn't take advantage of our resounding victory without leaving ourselves open to an attack from emo core Dumbledore, I made sure to get favorable terms in the subsequent peace deal. Marienburg might be treacherous scum but at least they don't enjoy picnics at the local cemetery and isn't best friends with a goddamn corpse. Next we make our first significant political move as emperor. We use our saved up political leverage and force Talabekland to fall under the direct control of the state. That meant that our economy went from making a thousand gold a turn, which I know isn't very much, to losing us 2000, which is even less. Now to solve this extremely complex economic conundrum and to keep my kneecaps unshattered, I did the big brain move and declared another war. Listen, all you need to know is that time is a flat circle and I don't have to explain shit. Unfortunately, it meant that we would lose every single province we got from our confederation to a horde of raging goblinoids. But wait, there is more. There are also three undead armies advancing from Bretonia. And on top of that, Festus and some ogres just declared war on us. It's uh, it's not looking very good for your boy. 
please, like the video, said help. Now all of this could most likely have been avoided if I actually planned what I was doing. But I play these games on a turn-to-turn -turn basis. I have played so many Twitch shooters and stuff in my time that I am flying by the seat of my pants. I rely solely on my instincts and a self-confidence that I have no right of having in myself. In other words, I'm making this shit up as I go along and things are probably gonna get a whole lot greener around here. But hey, at least we aren't losing money anymore. Oh my god, our economy this game is such a goddamn dumpster fire. In other words, we are surrounded by monsters beyond counting in an economy that makes the Great Depression sound like a time of happiness in abundance. So we do the only thing we can. We commit war crimes. First, we have to put out our burning countryside. And the way we do that is by grinding Kemmler's armies into fertilizer. And when he inevitably begs us for peace, we decline and remind him that he started this war in the first place. Then we take his cities one by one and establish a permanent garrison on the other side of the mountains. The Bretonians, they might be humans. But that does not mean that I have to trust them. Then we turn back home and deal with the Black Pit tribe. Now I might have started this war and in so doing condemning thousands of my own citizens to be turned into a nutritious broth to feed the despicable mushroommen from the north. But that's not what the history books will say. Because history is written by the literate. And there is a direct correlation between the well-being of historians and that of the state. In other words, our cause is just and the despicable orcs drew first blood. Next, we confederate with Visenland and Null, opening up a second front against the ogres. And also, against our own economy. Our monetary situation in this game is either make a decent amount of money, or being on the verge of bankruptcy. There is no in between. Thankfully, our problems were almost fixed when Festus decided to melt down one of our armies using Super Ebola. The keyword in that sentence was almost, which means that we still had some work to do. <coughs> Oh, that's disgusting. So I spent several minutes trying my hardest to scam anyone that will listen into having any sort of agreement with us and paying for the privilege. Now 25 gold might not sound like much, but when there is a bald green man beating down your door wanting to turn you into Mountain Dew, you take whatever you can get your hands on. Anyway, having groveled for spare change, my entire main army lose their collective shit while out on escapades on the high seas. The problem is, we are about a thousand miles away from the nearest ocean. But hey, I am not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. So I use this temporal loss of sanity to smash two of Festus's armies, repel an orc horde advancing through the Blackfire Pass, and push a Viking D-Day invasion back into the sea where they belong. I have no idea what we found in those forests that day, but smoking it was definitely the right choice. All of these things combined contributed to stabilizing our rapidly deteriorating situation. Our economy isn't a raging dumpster fire anymore, our armies are steadily growing, and we only have one more active enemy left on the board. And he's gone. Next, I head north into Kislev. Our northern brothers had been hammered pretty bad by some big ass rats and some spicy shortcakes. So I decided to channel my inner American and spread some freedom, brother. This would also give us an excellent opportunity to try out our newest invention. The land ship, which is a ship that goes on land. It's not very complicated and I absolutely adore it. It does come with a cannon and several men armed with anti-material rifles, which was a fact that I completely ignored in favor of ramming it through our enemy's lines at close to escape velocity. I realized that that is not how you're supposed to use it and I do not give a shit. Having introduced ourselves to the Northern Hemisphere, we confederated Ustland in order to have a base of operations from which we could conduct the war. Now that was a lie. I did it because I could. With our northern borders safe, we turned south to deal with the last two people who had any sort of chance of actually standing in our way. Tweaker Tree and Vlad von Dorkenstein. Now Vlad is actually kind of scary, I'm not gonna lie, because he is basically as strong as us. And also because he looks about as old as I feel when I realized that it was 25 years ago that Heroes of Might and Magic 3 was released. We had a good run, boys, but it is time 
time to start planning our burials. I know that tombs have fallen out of fashion in the last couple of thousand years, but I'm thinking about bringing it back. What do you think? Should we crowdfund a tomb? <laughs> okay, anyway, anyway, in order to psych ourselves up, we decided to deal with the tree first. And since I didn't have the heart to completely auto-resolve the entire war, and also because I wanted something to show, I did decide to fight the last battle. By which I mean that I blasted him with artillery for about 15 minutes. Then we advanced on Vlad. Since there was no way we could possibly match the numbers Vlad had at his disposal since he subscribed to the Soviet Wave Tactics Doctrine, I made sure to bring plenty of gunpowder instead. Our first move was to take Castle Tempelhof, Vlad's second largest city. We lined up our grand batteries and we reduced it to rubble before cleansing it of the undead. At the same time, on the western flank, we retook the moot, freeing the halflings. And in a heartfelt show of gratitude, they decided to never bother me. Now it is not often that you meet someone that understands you on a fundamental level. So if you are ever lucky enough to find one, hold on to them, because you never know if you are going to find them another one. The next turn I backed my army off and sacrificed the moot as a pawn in order to have a shot at the king. I said that I understood me, I never claimed that I actually cared. Now what I hadn't counted on was the fact that they could reach our armies this turn. And some of you might call this karma for my willful abandonment of the legally distinct short people of the moot. And I do not appreciate it. Being the emperor means that you have to make some tough choices. Abandoning the halflings wasn't one of them, but I, I want it on record, okay? I want it said. Now, losing a whole third of our combined armies would be pretty bad for the war effort. So, I decided to fight it out. Since they had to come to us, we maximized our chances of winning by positioning our army at the edge of a swamp to take advantage of the difficult terrain. And then we died. This was a major blow to us, but I remain confident in our ability to win. So when Vlad himself attacked Valdenhof, I out-resolved his ass, just to show everyone else how much of a non-threat he was. And also because fighting Vlad is such an unbelievable pain in the ass. With that, we had broken Vlad's back and made sure that our grip on the Empire could never be challenged ever again. So, with no real enemies around, since we had basically allied everyone, we spent roughly 15 turns doing some minor border skirmishes. Feeding our allies a bunch of lands to make sure they can protect our flanks, win a short victory and a long victory, and finally, the endgame crisis hits. And it's Lampiric Ascension. Again. Oh, come on. What are the odds? For fuck's sake. I had all of the crisis on, and we get the goddamn Vampiricus, Vampiric Ascension again. Fuck. Okay, it is not ideal, but I'll blast through it and it will be fine. It was not fine. Once again, the moment they got close to my lines, my entire army broke. I did not understand what was going on. I had fought his armies just a couple of turns ago, no problem. So, I began digging. And it turns out that my morale was 14. It's supposed to be 75. I do not know why this is a thing, but I suspect that the endgame crisis mod I have installed is doing some rather funky things. Now, I could restart the entire thing and start all over again with another crisis. But since there is nothing I hate more than wasting time, especially your time, I did the only thing I could. I made a music montage. And that is all I got, so thank you all so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't, and I will see you in the next one.